I think it's time to start. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Adrian Davis. I am going to be the host for this panel, which is going to cover a topic. Oh, no, please don't change the topic on me. Not now. <laughs> that would be fun. Which is going to be about uh, GDPR and uh, US data protection. Uh, privacy legislation, if such thing exists. So um, I'm, so I'm going to be the host here. I have a little bit of experience having implemented GDPR in the UK uh, and the EU, and having worked for an American company, and having had to put GDPR into an American company. If anybody wants to see the scars on my back, that's, that's, that's later. Um, I've also had to deal with uh, other privacy environments around the globe as well, not um, most recently, the Middle East as well. So I'm now going to shut up and introduce you to my panellists. They're going to do most of the talking today because they're far more interesting than I am. So in no particular order, we will start off with uh, Christian, if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Yes, yes, of course. My name is Christian Oudenbroek. I'm the CEO at Brand Compliance. Brand Compliance is a certification body specialising in information security and privacy. And next to that, I'm also one of the authors of the certification mechanism in relation to GDPR certification. Caroline. Uh, yes, hello, good morning everyone, and thanks for having me. My name is Caroline van Bell, and I am the managing partner of uh, Olinco. Olinco is a company of uh, the Kronos Group. Kronos is in fact one of the biggest IT groups uh, in Belgium. Myself, I'm working as a change manager and uh, the data protection officer for several um, private and public organizations, and I'm also developing uh, security awareness uh, programs to raise uh, user awareness. Hi everyone, and thank you for this invitation. Uh, I'm Ovidio Ionescu. I'm running a Romanian company, a small family company uh, that provides educational services. Uh, <coughs> it was focused for the years to provide uh, <coughs> uh, foreign languages trainings, but uh, recently we started to resell PACB trainings and certifications. I'm a PACB certified data protection officer and trainer and I have a small experience in practice of three years of uh, GDPR, both in corporate environment in, uh, <coughs> and in, uh, in private as, a, as an advisor. And I'm, I'm very thankful for this, this challenge to, to present today this interesting topic. Excellent, thank you very much. So the good news is we've all got a little bit of knowledge about GDPR. We've all been through the fun and the pain. Now it's your turn. You don't have to introduce all yourselves. I noticed the look of fear on faces there. <laughs> no, I'm going to ask you a question first, because a true panel should understand its audience. So please raise your hand, either your left or your right, it doesn't matter, if you have participated, led, or been involved in a GDPR implementation in an organisation. Please raise your hands. Excellent. We'll be coming back and asking you lots of questions later. How many of you have had to do a US data? Marvel, oh, even better. And how many of you have done both? I can say that as well. Excellent, right, so <clears throat> in that case, we'll be looking for you to come and ask us the difficult questions as well, and we may well be looking for you to share some of your insights, because the more of us who speak in this, the more we'll learn. So I shall keep an eye out for your hands being raised. And one thing, by the way, during this panel, if you want to make a point, you want to say something, you violently disagree with me or us, put your hand up straight away, please. We want to make this as interactive as we can. And as I say, the more we talk, the more we learn. Right, so let's do the first question. That's an interesting, spe uh, I did not expect to see so many hands going up for both. I thought there'd be one or two. So I'm really pleased about it. So let's, um, Let's start off now asking our panel what they think some of the, the, uh, the key differences are when you tackle a GDPR and then maybe tackle a, a US approach. And as we start off with Christian, we're going to work our way this way. Yes. So that means that Caroline starts off now. Okay. Okay. Christian was first, you see. <coughs> right. So um, in, in Europe, uh, privacy is in fact a basic uh, human uh, right. Uh. So GDPR sets the standard for data privacy of EU uh, data subjects mm -hmm. worldwide. Uh, uh, in America, the law takes a more fragmented <laughs> approach. It's, it's more uh, bottom up, coming from the states up. And in Europe, we have GDPR as uh, top 
uh, down. Um, so in fact, in, in America, there is no um, data privacy law that uh, regulates all data or is the same for all uh, companies. So uh, today we can say that there is not yet a US equivalent uh, to uh, GDPR. Okay. <clears throat> First, I need to, to underline a thing. I, will, I took the theoretical approach because while I was in practice, I was the man with the law in his hand. Uh, for this meeting, I studied the uh, law project, uh, American Data Protection and Privacy Act, and tried to make a comparison with uh, GDPR, if this American Act will enter into force. And uh, in my opinion, the question is that if in the actual form that was uh, published in June in front of the Congress of United States, the US American Data Privacy Act is suitable enough to support the European Commission to release an adequate decision for the US, or at least to ease the business processes and the compliance requirements between EU and US <coughs> company. I think that from here we could start, not just as, prof uh, as professionals that are looking for effective compliance, but also the two regulatory bodies if they are looking to match their <coughs> interest for the individuals, consumer protection, business development, and data security. Uh, <coughs> I think it's normal to look where it's a framework in place. And uh, if we look to, to the requirements for an adequate decision, we see that the ADPPA has some gaps, namely that <coughs> there are no rules and mechanisms for the transfer of personal data to third countries and or international organizations. And this could be <coughs> easily come and say that there are no effective and enforceable data subject rights and no effective administrative and judicial redresses for the data subject whose personal, personal data shall be transferred by US covered entities to third country or international <coughs> organization. I would uh, underline and not to, 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 to say everything that I wrote here, I would underline uh, <coughs> uh, something that is related to and you can compare from the perspective of the rights and the principles between ADPPA and GDPR. The American Data Protection Act doesn't impose a reporting mechanism for personal data breaches and an obligation for notifying the individuals when the breach is likely to result in a high risk to individuals' privacy, doesn't provide explicit rules for applying the principle of accuracy, and doesn't provide an explicit right for the individuals to not to be the subject of a decision based solely on algorithm as is stated in the, this act, including profiling, although uh, it tries to cover this subject to the opt-out opt right for targeted <coughs> advertising and also is imposing some requirements for an algorithm impact. Uh, I will finish with this. In the American project, it's a big segregation between the covered entities, because between the large data holders and small businesses that in my opinion, I think to, that the <coughs> standards to, should be lowered a little bit to, to provide effective protection for the consumers in this in US case. Okay, Thank we'll you. come back to that in a minute, but we'll go to Christian. Yes, my <coughs> point of view is from a more business point of view, <coughs> where I think that within, within the GDPR, uh, the, the consumer's rights, and, and that, that was the starting point for, for privacy, while in, in, in the US you have more freedom for, for exploration, for innovation, for, for setting up uh, new new businesses, new ventures, um, and and I think that uh, there should be a balance between the, the 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 privacy of the individual versus the the, the innovation and and business uh, businesses. It's uh, it's it's uh, it, it's well known that most most uh, yeah, big tech, for example, starts in the U.S. Mm -hmm. for reason that they have more freedom, more um, um, more innovative innovative solutions to things. That's more my point. So do you think that as it currently stands, the lack of overall American law, despite the American yeah. uh, Data Protection project. Act project coming through, do you think that the American approach to data privacy is better for innovation and the EU one isn't? Exactly. It's, it's worse for innovation, yes. I'll make it really clear. Really clear. Yeah. Um, is that because, because you've got to answer the question now, you can't just say yes, is that because GDPR puts too many obligations on companies also, or startups? But it's also <coughs> the starting point where, right. uh, where in, in, in Europe, for example, people tend to think different about privacy. And mm -hmm. I, I see that uh, uh, from 
if you look at the world, depending on where you are, uh, considerations regarding privacy differ. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's also one, one element in this difference. Yeah. Uh, so someone once said to me in India, uh, I apologize to any Indians in the audience, they went, we care about our cows, our gold, and our families. Privacy? Nah, it's Western stuff. <laughs> so there, I understand exactly. there's a cultural thing here as well. Yes. Uh, and when we talk about data protection, we must always remember it sits within the culture of organizations and a culture of the social economic fabric of, of yep. the, 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 the country or the region or whatever. Exactly. Uh, and uh, going back to, the, again, just to make sure we get this really clear, and feel free, if you think we're wrong, wrong or we've missed something here, do tell us. Mm -hmm. Put your hands up. Um, GDPR, because it comes from a certain cultural viewpoint, reinforces certain things that have to be done and may not encourage out of the ordinary. Exactly. My feeling is that within the GDPR, they have raised the level to, to accommodate all the countries within Europe. Even within Europe, within different countries, you have a different perspective on, on privacy. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they, they raised the bar to, to, to accommodate everyone, everyone within the European community, uh, in the European Union. Uh, so that's why it has become a little bit more difficult. Caroline, you're a data protection officer. What do you think? Well, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, so uh, the GDPR sets uh, very high standards. Uh, it's the, it's the toughest uh, privacy law in, in the mm -hmm. world. And I was thinking, uh, because, OK, we are, we are now speaking about the US, but you also have China and the whole TikTok uh, discussion also, mm. uh, where there's also no privacy rules uh, or, or very, very little uh, privacy uh, uh, rules. So um, yes, indeed, but I am uh, yeah, certainly in favor of GDPR because it gives you certain rights also as a data subject over your, uh, over your data. Eh? Uh, so, and these rights you do not have in countries like uh, other countries outside, yeah. uh, out, outside Europe. So, G oh, <coughs> can we have the microphone please? Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, go for it. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Benjamin Kornhauser. Uh, I have a question regarding, it's, I guess it's a question, it's more for Caroline, but, but uh, uh, other people can answer too. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that keep being asked to me and I don't have the answer. It's how easy is it with the GPR, uh, GDPR law uh, or regulation uh, to be removed from uh, searches on uh, search engines. As in, I understand that you can place requests in different companies if you want to know what data they hold, etc. But how about the search engines? Yeah. Can, you, can you easily act uh, against that? Because I don't have the answer, and the question keeps being asked to me. Thank you. Yes, good question. Uh, Yes, indeed. Uh, so in, in GDPR, you have this the right to be forgotten uh, okay. as a, as a mm. data subject. Uh, you are all data subjects in, in GDPR. And so uh, in Belgium, in fact, Google got fined uh, for that. And they got a fine of 600,000 euros uh, because they didn't respect uh, the right to be forgotten from a data subject who asked uh, not to be um, uh, found anymore in, in Google. And Google was uh, fined for that. So there are fines because this right is not uh, respected. Thank you, Caroline. I think you have to, you have to write to the company as the data subject, yeah. tell them you want to be forgotten under article, oh, I can't remember what it is now, whatever it is, under the article. And then if you appear in the search engine or whatever it may be, you can then report that to your information commissioner or, or equivalent. Yes, in fact, yeah. uh, each um, European country has a, an independent data yes. protection authority uh, where you can uh, file uh, yeah. complaints or, or report uh, things. Yeah. Yeah. Just so we know the process, so everyone, if you don't know it, you understand how it's how it's meant to work. Gentlemen, next to you. Oh, hello, Tony. Thank hello. you. Uh, <laughs> we know each other for years. Yeah. <laughs> correct me if I'm not mistaken. In the U.S., there is the California Privacy Act, which is very stringent. And yes. they protect a lot. So uh, because it was mentioned that they don't have a privacy, I think they do have, and it's very stringent because I have been there. And they are very particular about a few things that even more than GDPR, to be honest, mm. on that. Uh, yes, sorry. But, but the question is about that if it's a 
federal law to cover all the states, and this is not in America. They don't have for the moment a federal law to enforce the privacy rights on all the US states. So there are only five states in US that have privacy that uh, manage to take by themselves and uh, uh, put in place privacy laws. And congratulations to them. Probably they are good, but for the whole United States, there are no, no such law. There are sectorial laws in different uh, fields like health, financial. Yeah, uh, the, there's hi, there's, uh, it's HIPAA, which is the HIPAA. Data Protection Act for the health industry. Yes. And there, but that's a federal law, but there isn't a federal data protection act yet. There is FISMA as well, which is, that only applies to governments, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah it, I've been doing American telecoms recently, and that's just even more horrendous. Yeah, the Americans have a, the problem is, the EU has GDPR, which is, it's the same across Europe. The Americans have state laws, which are, there's 50 states, which means there's always 51 laws. Because <laughs> I always disagree. And then there's the federal level above that, and at the moment, there's, you're right, California has a very good, very good data procedure act, but it only works if you're in California, you work or buy things from a California organization. Or, I, I can't remember the exact, but you know what I'm saying. It's only very quite focused on that. If you live in California, yeah. That's, yeah, thank you. Cool. Right, so um, we, we've kind of just, just we've, we've talked about a few bits and pieces already. Let's just see if we can summarize this first question. What do you think is the biggest difference? in achieving compliance against GDPR and oh, we've kind of answered the question, but let's make sure we answer it properly. What is the key difference between compliance, achieving compliance with GDPR and trying to meet the American multi-layered approach? What's the one big difference in your experience? Well, let me see. <laughs> uh, I don't have so, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't really with my key. I sent, them, I sent these questions three weeks let, ago. Yeah. Let, let me see that. <laughs> as, as an American uh, company and you're processing uh, data from uh, you, EU uh, citizens and you're not uh, compliant to GDPR, then yeah, you can get fines. Eh? So, and these yeah. fines can <coughs> be very high. Uh, they, they can be an, up to 4% uh, of your annual turnover or 20 million euros, uh, yeah. whichever it is highest. So it's something to um, uh, bear in mind or otherwise uh, if you're not compliant yeah it's simple you cannot do business with uh, EU then. Excellent. Uh, Christian. My, my, my point is that uh, within GDPR if you want to be compliant it's uh, it's um, it is such a high level that you totally need to reorganize your organization mm -hmm. from a business point of view. Okay. And it makes it very important, but also very heavy. Uh, I think that uh, there are a lot of uh, ISO standards that are, uh, can cover business activities across the globe, and these can uh, match the business requirements from one side or another. And as a key difference, as I mentioned, uh, in the US we don't have uh, a mechanism for trans international transfers to protect the data. We have in Europe, and in yeah. from Europe to, to outside, it's protected. But another way around, not. So to, to make a complete framework to match these regulations, there, there are some gaps that need to be, to be covered. Okay, super, right. Uh, and from my viewpoint, I'll tell you the biggest difference between achieving compliance between the EU and, and America. There's a lot less lawyers in the, in the EU. <laughs> You have to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, I saw two hands go up. Um, ladies first, we'll, we'll, be, we'll do ladies first, and then we'll do, we'll do Kern. Hi, I'm Michael Redmond. I'm from New York, uh, working in Louisville. Uh, we, uh, my question is, uh, uh, being in the States and a practitioner, <laughs> working for firms in the past that have had, we would have to comply with GDPR, so we have to know it. I had to be GDPR certified. We also have to comply if we are working throughout the whole United States with the five state laws. And it, HIPAA is not a federal law, just to correct, but it's, it oh, is only sorry. industry. And then what's fortunate about it, the HIPAA requirements for privacy were changed during COVID. So that was very confusing for people. Uh -huh. What's the new HIPAA requirements? What's the new changes on that? What's, what's out? What are they allowing that's no longer, they're gonna be a little loosey-goosey about, to put it, you know, because <laughs> they, they had to, because they weren't, technology wasn't up to speed. 
to deal with many of the privacy laws when people were working remotely, when people had to be treated out to get their inoculations out in a parking lot, and you know they didn't have tablets, so it was a, a wildness. So my question is, we're having a hard time in the US, very hard time, because we have to comply with all the different states. Um, I happen to currently be the CISO for Louisville, Kentucky, and I have responsibility for the healthcare department, and all of our privacy. Now, granted, we're in New York. We're only in Louisville right now. I'm originally from New York. But I also have a consulting firm. And so in that consulting firm, I have to deal with all of these issues with my clients. So the question is, we're having a hard time, and we know them. I even wrote the article that for uh, PECB Insight Magazine mm -hmm. on this topic. So and I did all the research, and I'm still having, <laughs> like, OK, I know what all the laws are. We, we I know what it is. Seats. No, thank you. No, thank you. Writing the article was hard enough. That's okay. I'm like my seat. My question is, um, how do people in other countries who are dealing with the U.S. who have to meet the same requirements deal with some of these issues with the multiple regulations we have reference privacy? And we say because it's, it's looking at, uh, and they're changing. They're changing and they're mm. updating. And Every state, went through every state's privacy. Uh, this was like a thesis. So, but I went through every state's privacy, laid them out. They're different. Yeah. There's not a commonality among them. And some are better, and some are missing things. California used to be the best. And others said, well, we have that as its template. Let's bring it higher. But we don't like that. Let's throw that out. <laughs> oh, that's good. Let's keep this. So it is so piecemeal that you have to have an Excel spreadsheet spread out, literally and mapping all your controls. It's easier to map ISO 22301, 2701, you know, going through that than it is to do this. My question is, we're having a hard time and we're used to it. How do, do other people from other countries deal with this when they have US clients? So that's my question. They also use Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> 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 and to, to make it a little bit more advanced, there is uh, software on the market where you can uh, where you have already the different standards and, and schemes already set up, and then the, the mapping is done automatically. So you need to question, so you need to answer all the questions that are in the software to become compliant with all the different regulations in the different states. But in essence, it's the same as an Excel, Excel spreadsheet, only a little bit more fancy. Yeah, to run uh, different systems, procedures, and processes. Eh? Do it, do, yeah, do it twice. Anything for me, Richie? <coughs> no, the, I, 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 I support the Christian decision. There are, there are tools, there are applications mm -hmm. that are supporting the compliance and mapping the data and having all the registry, registry that are uh, required and the automatizations for this. But dealing with US, we probably will have to ask them to, to respect GDPR. And while, while we're doing this, we, we, you, we use that part with the international transfers of data, and they have to comply with this. And at the middle, as mentioned, there are uh, standards, like uh, 2701.01 yep. and for privacy and so on, that can uh, <coughs> bring together the, the requirements, help the U.S. To, to respect the requirements. And if the company is small and cannot afford to, to implement a full standard, can take from each standard what is needed to comply with, with different uh, regulations. Maybe some of the uh, applicabilities of that study size or standards can cover m more uh, low requirements. Thank you. We have, I know, low, I know I saw three hands go up. I'm just gonna, can I just ask the audience here, how many of you have had to deal with data protection from this side of the pond going to that side of the pond? Are you from Europe to the US, apart from our American friend here? Good. Um, so, let's do the hands, thank you. You might want to talk to these gentlemen afterwards, <laughs> um, apart from spreadsheets. Um, I really do wish I'd invented Excel. Uh, so, first and foremost, uh, as Kern, your hand went up. I saw Tony, your hand go up, and I saw your hand up, uh, Mr. Sir. I don't know your name, I will find out, I apologise. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Kun Mates from Brown Compliance. Um, yeah, I've been working in privacy for, I think, 10 years now, and um, from my point of view, one of the main discussion points is just the basics. What is personal data? Uh, if we go to have a look on GDPR, we stated personal data. In uh, the US, we talk about the PII, or personal identify information. 
and there is really a, a big difference between uh, and maybe uh, a question to you guys from the panel um, is it not the easiest solution to talk the same language and to have it <laughs> about the same data uh, because personal data is really another topic than personal identifying information yes. very different okay well can we just hold that thought because I want to capture the the two yes you have something. Right, we'll come back to that. So I want to capture the two comments because they seem to be a bit of a thread going on. I hope you get a shoe allowance for the amount of walking you're doing. <laughs> Correct me if I'm not mistaken. In the CISSP course, it mentioned clearly that if you have US Shield, if you comply with that, then you, have a, you don't have a problem with the code. This is what was mentioned. Um, Correct me if I'm mistaken. <laughs> this is what it was mentioned because I'm giving that course every time. And it's mentioned clearly that if you, ha if you comply with that, <coughs> then you shouldn't have a problem. <laughs> I was going to say, did, didn't Privacy Shield collapse? Yeah. yeah. 2020? Yeah. Yeah, Privacy Shield did mm -hmm. collapse. When? Uh, a couple of years ago. Oh, three years ago. Mm -hmm. I think it's time for IC Square to update their teaching material. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work for IC Square. I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> that's why we're having this. But yeah, that's, that's one of the things. And I think actually, um, when we come on to one of our questions and we talk about Max Schrems, we'll probably touch on Privacy Shield yes. as well. Yeah. So the gentleman with the nice tie and the waistcoat on. Yeah, don't wear ties. <laughs> <laughs> so, so all the fellows have red ties in our company, so this is part of the game, okay? I'd like to add a comment. Um, I'm Ralph from Society Security Group, a 600 cyber experts, and we're talking on stage at 1.30. So um, when we talk about GDPR, and you mentioned it in the, in the first sentence, you know, we have reached GDPR in, in the European area, in, in the European Union area. And this was quite a big, big success also for Jan Philipp Albrecht, who put a lot of efforts in this, in this story. But if you look at the history, if you watch the history, it also in European countries, the first um, act we have had in, in, in European was the Hessen Data Privacy Act. And this was raised in 1970. And by this, many of the Germans think, say, hey, yeah, we have eaten GDPR inside, you know, and we are the best out of it. No, we are not. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do in every country. But this was a starting point with the acts all over the world, 1970, and we just mm -hmm. celebrated the 50th anniversary in Hessen in Germany due to this first act ever on the world. And this was one region. And this is a little bit like the story in the US. When I talk to the US clients, it's a little bit like this. We talk about CCPA, CRPA, we talk about New York State Act and all this other stuff with HIPAA and so on. But this is a starting point in the US. So it's a little bit like the this, this, like this story we have also already have had in the European Union, and by this we have had these different acts in the different European countries. And finally, the, the guys in the European Union recognized, hey, we need a common, a common level. And by this they decided to um, work on a regulation, and this has, um, was a tough work between um, uh, 2000, uh, 2016 and 2018, I guess. And it was really a hard time for, for rising this kind of regulation. So it's a little bit the same story in the US. We rise, we see, we watch it, and we see they have different local acts, more and more coming aware, more and more people asking for privacy. It's uh, not about only GDPR, it's also about the, the charta of the human rights we're talking about. And of course, GDPR is one out of it. And from my perspective, GDPR is a USP. It's not a barrier to the companies. It's not a barrier to the people. It supports the people to keep in con stay in control on their own data and to raise awareness. And by this, we can focus this and bring this also into business perspective to huge global companies who recognize more and more GDPR as a gold standard to keep control on all, every kind of data. And this is, this is a quite a cool story. And finally, I would like to add the first man on, on planet who talked in public about privacy was not a European guy. It was Kennedy in the 60s <laughs> when they started with the count of the, of, the, of the population when he recognized that privacy is really worth to think about. Thanks. Mm. Thank you very much. And, and yes, we forget that data protection has been going for a good 50, 60 years. It always feels like it's something quite new and exciting. Um, 
I will come back to you about sure. personal data versus PII, but I, I can see hands coming up, so I want to keep going, please. <clears throat> oh, so this is Benjamin again. Uh, I, I do have a question regarding the true protection of uh, European, Europe-based citizens uh, when they subscribe to uh, American hosted services. Are we truly protected by GDPR? If, for instance, you, I don't know, I mean, look at the GAFAM. You purchase on Amazon, you surf, uh, you navigate on Google, uh, you use Facebook. Are you truly protected? Because, I mean, the, the, the problem is the system itself, the very system, sits across the Atlantic. So it's, it sounds a bit difficult, it sounds a bit challenging to be okay. protected. Right, so I've written that question down and we'll answer it after we've done the personal data PII one, okay? Yes. Okay, so I have written it down, so I will remember, I promise. Right, so let's go back to the question about can we all talk the same language? Uh, <clears throat> having written standards for ISO, yes, you can blame me for some of the 27,000 series. Um, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> however, when I say I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the, you, the audience, as a show of hands, and I'll come to you, then we'll talk about personal data. If I said personal data to you in the audience, do you, do you think I am talking exactly in the same language as you believe I'm talking? In other words, if I say personal data, you're thinking dates of birth, place of birth, name, children. Are you thinking like that when I say personal data to you? If you agree with me, raise your hand. So if you think, I, when I talk about personal data, I'm talking about dates of birth, children's names, like raise your hand. That's what you think when I talk per Interesting. So any of you who didn't raise your hand, what do you think I'm talking about when I say personal data? What do you think it is? You know, right now, with uh, people have to, you have to enable Google Maps to know where you're at. You have to mm -hmm. enable this. It gives us that priority. But we didn't have that a few years ago. Exactly. And not all the apps have it where they're tracking you, and, they're, and also when you're going online, where you're buying, where you're purchasing from. If I decide that I want to have a chocolate cookie at 6 a.m., is that anybody's business? <laughs> no, but yet they're gonna know, and if I buy it online. And so all that information, it says, you know, it will, will allow you what you have to have, but they consider that have to have. So no, I think the answer is, there's quite a lot more. Would you mind just passing the microphone down to this young lady at the front? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. She just put her hand up and you didn't see it. That's all. <laughs> Hi. As per GDPR, it is anything related to the person as a human exactly. being. Yes. Everything. Exactly. You can, it can be the medical history. It can be the political uh, opinion. It can be anything related to the person as exactly. a person. Well, I think one of the key, thing, one of the key things I, I'm getting here is, is that actually we all know the GDPR definition, but we all probably colour it in with different ideas, whether it's photographs, it's geolocation, whatever else. So if we... Oh, drop your pen. If we, <laughs> sorry, Please. just throw things at people, why not? Um, so if we all can't actually come up with a good definition of personal data, despite the fact it's written down for us, what's PII? This is your bit, this is your chance. And therefore, how do, uh, how do we identify personal, or how can we define, back to your question, personal data and PII? And I'll start with a video, and I know Caroline wants to say something. She's looking at me. <laughs> Uh, back to your, to your questions, I just wanted <coughs> to make a completion to complete you because you are right from the perspective of terminology but the things can go more deeper because in EU we, ba we are talking about a fundamental right to, to protection of personal data while in, uh, in US, if you let me read, uh, <coughs> the right to privacy has been carved out of various rights, as for example, the right to personal security, personal liberty, and private property. Just later, in 65, was has been carved out, uh, was recognized, recognized as emanating from the penumbras of the 14th Amendment. So the privacy right is not a pr fundamental right. In 70s, <coughs> by the way, 70s, I read that the f uh, Federal Trade Commission was enforced uh, with the <coughs> with the taking care of, with the care of privacy in relations with the consumers. So also from 70s they started to, to have a view on privacy, but not as is, it is from in EU as a fundamental right. It's just in the, in the private law, in the business consumer and uh, business. 
uh, in where it's about uh, breaching privacy for establishing public order or so on, they don't have any rules and nothing. So this I want to make a comparison between fundamental rights and the <coughs> notion of privacy, how it is in, in uh, US. Okay. Perhaps to answer to your question, mm. uh, Adrian, um, so what is personal data? Uh, according to GDPR, it's anything that can identify you as a person directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. Also indirectly, this is uh, very important. So we process personal data. Process personal data is basically anything you can do with personal data. So GDPR says processing personal data is forbidden unless you have a, law, a lawful ground uh, to do it. And one of the six lawful grounds is consent. That is why uh, when GDPR came up in 2018, consent, uh, we got mails from everywhere asking <laughs> for our consent uh, to uh, be able to process our data uh, further. So today we, we are here in this event, uh, so uh, we see uh, that there are movies from us, uh, photographs from us, but it's also because we've given our consent uh, to, to do that and so that uh, those pictures uh, can be mm. taken. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a very important um, lawful ground in GDPR is uh, consent. Mm -hmm. I, I see it as a transaction that you yeah. give some of your information, if you, uh, some of your data in return for some, to get something. For example, uh, it took me about three hours this morning to get here uh, and I used Google Maps. <laughs> and it was not only my data that I sent, but then I see in the, in the map yeah. where, where it is busy at the moment. So that mm -hmm. means that other people have given up uh, their, their information and their data as well. And I, I, I use this as a very useful tool. And I know that I'm giving up something because they, they make points where I'm driving at what time and at what, what speed, all, all the different things. But I see it as a transaction. I give something and I take something from it. Yeah. And that's very much the American view, isn't it? Was if I give you something as a exactly. service, we swap, etc. Um, we need to. I apologise. The screen keeps flashing. It's annoying me as well because I can see out the corner of my eye. I'll just go and hit the laptop in a minute. <laughs> um, let's. I, I want to go back to this question because I think act, actually one of the, the what you've touched on is something bigger, and, and, and our, our friend from New York um, and Louisville also mentioned this is how these interact because one of the key things is is that no. I'm going to say this very carefully. No country is an island. Uh, it might be geographically, but we, we all interconnect somehow. And, and I think one of the big things is, is how do we, uh, CISOs as, as privacy professionals, how do we manage those connections? And you made the, the point about if I buy from Amazon and I'm in the EU, do I still get EU data protection rights? And I, I think that's a, a really good thing to touch on. So going completely off the script now, <laughs> as usual. Um, what are the key things, do you think, for managing the, the, the interactions, especially between, as it's on the, the screen there, the, the EU approach and the uh, US approach? What are the key interactions or the key touch points you've got to consider? I think one very important one is the, the number of organizations that are involved in, in, the, in the transfer of the information. Mm -hmm. And it might very well be that, for example, in, in the example with Amazon, uh, that there are a number of other organizations involved that you don't, that you're not aware of. That is, I, I, I think, a very important part in, 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 in keeping things uh, secure or private. So it's not just knowing I'm, well, I'm buying something from Amazon, it's how my data gets from me Exactly. To Amazon, who, who transmits it, handles it, processes it, etc. Exactly. <coughs> you, you need to pay with a payment provider, and they have uh, sub, -provi sub providers providing a service specifically for the payment provider, and yeah. so on. Could be like, like hundreds of organizations that are involved. Okay. Yes, so uh, GDPR sets privacy uh, first, uh, while US regulations will focus more on data security. Yeah and the importance of private uh, records. So privacy itself is often uh, absent from uh, the discussion. Okay. Uh, as per your questions, a lot of big companies move their headquarters here and their servers for, uh, for complying with, with GDPR. And uh, the, advantage, sorry. the <coughs> advantage of uh, the GDPR implementation is that uh, a comp a compliance programs can uh, <coughs> cover the full track of data. Is map, the data is mapped from the 
entrance of in the company's environment till the exit and further to where to other <coughs> receivers. Uh, the controllers have to ensure that the receivers, in some cases, are ensuring proper safe grounds. And uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> also in GDPR, we have this this mechanism of reporting data breaches that is, is very useful for the individuals. They, they <coughs> it raises the, the right to of, to of the individual to be informed and to control his data because he's aware if a data breach had, had happened to, to a controller. And, and this is about, about GDPR, about the uh, American mm -hmm. Act. I can tell something that wasn't adopted and what they are looking for. And what, what, is, what looked interesting for me in their project is the uh, Yout Privacy and Marketing Division that shall be established or uh, <coughs> a business mentorship uh, <coughs> office that shall be established. Uh, they have some sections regarding digital content forgeries. Uh, <coughs> they have sections for compliance gu guidelines and technical compliance programs, as you said. The security, they are focused more on security. They have regulatory and reporting procedure, procedure for algorithm and privacy impact assessment. So the controllers, covered entities, uh, needs to report yearly their privacy impact uh, assessments and to make publish mm -hmm. some, <coughs> some of the, the, the outcomes, the results. And also they, about big process, pro <coughs> pro data processor, they look to regulate the third party collecting en entities and the unified opt-out <laughs> mechanism that can answer to your question about how do you uh, retreat your data from, from the internet. Probably they go in this direction with, with uh, these rules that mm -hmm. they hopefully will <laughs> adopt at the moment, mm -hmm. but it, it will not be easy. I think, okay. and to, to, go, to go on uh, as well with your question, I, mean, I always buy everything from Amazon SARL, which is based in Luxembourg. Yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> I don't make the assumption. Um, I believe, though I do sometimes check, that all my data is therefore processed in accordance with EU law by Amazon and it is processed within the EU because it is, it, everything comes through Amazon SARL. Um, this is the URL, sorry. Uh, this is the URL. Well, yeah, because everything comes through the company Amazon SARL, which is, what, which is based in Luxembourg. Now, the problem is, um, as we all know, cloud computing, yes, there's somewhere there's tin. There is going to be hardware that blinks and does stuff. But with the cloud, and the idea of the cloud is being flexible and elastic and it's, the processing is moved around the world, it is very difficult to know at any one particular time what's actually going on and where it's going on. Now, I know Amazon and Google have got clouds, the European cloud, and it's based in Ireland. I hope you knew that, right? I'm not laying any secrets out, am I? Um, <laughs> it's a really cool data center. It's very, very cool because it rains a lot. Um, that's Ireland. Uh, but <laughs> so I know that, and that technically is where all of the European Union data for Amazon is processed. Well, there are other sites, you know what I mean? But Amazon claim that it all happens within this European cloud. But if it's a bad day, they have an outage, who knows where it goes? Who knows how it's routed from my purchase point, which could be in Brussels, to get to the European cloud? All it takes is someone who, who mistypes in or misconfigures a router and it can go through China before you know. So although GDPR and although we have a lot of um, legal and written safeguards, I think sometimes the technology is a little bit ahead of the law and maybe a little bit ahead of our understanding of both how the technology and the law works, uh, which is an interesting viewpoint because we were talking about the metaverse earlier on and I think there's, there's, there's some interaction here. Um, I saw a gentleman at the back. We, we, I said we'd get to you. <laughs> you had a question. Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Morning. So, uh, okay, my question and concern is um, <coughs> I'm just thinking Quack. out of curiosity that probably that's um, a fundamental um, issue, even with the naming convention. Maybe that's why we have those disparity because when you look at GDPR, it's saying general data protection regulation. And there is actually a distinction between data protection and privacy. You know, data protection is very technical. It has to do with the technical implication. Why privacy, it's a legal issue. So my question is, 
uh, is there a way, probably because we look at the US, the US thinks California Consumer Privacy Act is very direct to privacy. But GDPR is saying protection. So the question is, is GDPR really a privacy regulation or a data protection regulation? So probably that's why we have those disparity and some people are thinking, mm. should we adopt this, should we not? This is not clear. I think maybe it's something we need to discuss. Thank you. Ooh. I love having a panel of experts. <laughs> <laughs> this I, is I, what we call a hospital pass in rugby. This is the one you give to your mate so he gets injured. <laughs> Over to you, team. <laughs> Very good question. I, Thank I, you. I agree. Mm. I agree. It's more about data protection. So. Yeah, it's about, it's about our privacy. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's about our privacy, but it's, it's our data eh, that is processed. Eh? So, so it's, it's about this to protect the data that is it's processed. Eh? Mm -hmm. so. Of course, through <laughs> by processing the data, you, you can breach the privacy of an individual. So I think that are connected. And uh, GDPR can be completed from the, uh, in delay regarding uh, privacy because uh, I, they, there will be a regulation for uh, electronic communication, I think, soon uh, released. So this will complete also the, yeah. the <coughs> uh, it will be a new tool in processing personal data in uh, <coughs> electronic communication. So together will be a, a framework for protecting the privacy. Why not? Because uh, your data tells everything about you. If I know your hour and date of birth, I can find a lot of things of you. So then maybe they should change the name and make um, general <laughs> data protection <laughs> and privacy regulation for clarity, I think. I, I don't know. It's well, something PCB and the professionals in the EU can take up. Thank well, you. Actually, a, a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I know a c several of us have talked about GDPR raising a high barrier, and we've talked about GDPR being applicable across all of the EU countries, um, maybe they couldn't get to agree on privacy, so they just did data protection, because that was easier. <laughs> and we know how difficult that was to get GDPR from its initial thoughts into the place we are now. So I think maybe that we, we should look at this. GDPR, I don't think, is the final word. I think it's part of a journey. And you've mentioned things like the uh, telecommunications and the um, various other bits and pieces coming through. I think the EU is on a journey where we will end up with a, can I call it the EU Privacy Act? Just, just as an example, I think we will end up there, but I think, we, I think the journey will, will be done in small steps. Totally That's my personal view. Oh, thank you very much. GDPR is a journey, not a destination. Yes. <laughs> uh, someone else had their hand up. Uh, right, we've only got, we've got 10 minutes, so we need to think of some summaries. So while we deal with the next question, start thinking of how we're going to summarize the discussion and actually answer the question. Because we've gone completely off our script, so we have no answers now. Uh, but we're looking forward to it. You raised your hand, sir, and there was another hand. I saw lady there. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Helen Walters. I'm a data privacy manager in, in the UK. Um, and I wanted to go back a little bit on the notion of consent because it's, a, again, something very different depending on which legislation you look at. And interestingly enough, I don't remember giving my consent to being recorded. Um, it might have been buried in the T's and C's. But what I find interesting is it, how can it really be consent in this scenario? Because, well, once, how would we manage uh, withdrawal of consent? If one of us said, actually, I've changed my mind, um, I don't want to be recorded. How, how is that going to be managed? I think that might be quite difficult. No, don't take a photograph now. Please don't take a photograph. <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing is that we've made it, kind, if we, we are using consent in this scenario, it's quite conditional. Well, you know, the other option I have is not to come. And under GDPR, we can't make consent conditional. So, but it's interesting because it's a challenge daily in companies, we want to do initiatives where we want to record people, and, and it's great, you know, we want to push employee engagement, etc. Yeah. But consent is, is a notion that I find very difficult to work with um, under the GDPR, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. You mentioned consent. Yes, yes. <laughs> I totally agree, totally agree. Yeah, this is why uh, consent, it is never uh, um, 
a checked box on beforehand. You, it, you should do an action for that and you give your consent and read for what g you give your consent. And this is why also you have um, a lot of times also a privacy statement with consent because there they explain, okay, what they will do with your data, how long they will keep it, eh, for what destination. Eh. So that is, this is why worthwhile when you give your consent to also have a look at the, at the privacy statement. And the privacy statement, that doesn't need to be uh, incomprehensible language. Eh. It needs to be to the point and really clear what they are doing uh, uh, with your data. But consent is in GDPR a very, very important action. Uh, and it should be always, it should require an action from, from you uh, with uh, well informed what uh, they are doing uh, with, uh, with the data. Yeah. So what is the basis if you have consent. consent. We all gave consent when we... Um, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then they blur you on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> They'll pixelate you. <laughs> um, that... This is a, I mean, it's a very specific example, um, but there is, there is a big thing about informed consent uh, and everything else. And having worked with an American company where we had half a million EU um, emails and they wanted to keep sending out um, information and oh, that's, um, that's the shut up Adrian alarm. Uh, they actually had, um, we actually had to go through all of those half million emails at the time and get consent and say, you know, do you still want to be on our email address? And we had to do it every six months just to keep it flowing. Um, informed consent or consent of any type is huge. And I don't think we've cracked it yet properly. With all the automation and with all the other bits and pieces we have and talk about things like Facebook and everything else, everyone knows that you should actively give consent but I think it's sort of slipped down whereby if you're there, you're giving your consent. It's not as informed or as active as perhaps it should be. That just could be the fact we focus on other bits of GDPR first to get those bits right. And that could be something we see more evidence and more focus being put on um, from the EU. That's again a suggestion rather than a, a factual comment. Right. Um, <coughs> Okay, we've got enough time for two questions and summaries. So we'll do the gentleman at the front, please, and then we'll do our American friend, don't worry. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Zimam Zubir from Algeria, north of Africa. Then uh, I have two, uh, two questions, if, uh, if possible. Uh, secondly, uh, another outside of comparison on GDPR uh, and the uh, US data privacy legislation, is, uh, I think uh, we, we should uh, adopt a large, large approach. Then we uh, implicated uh, Africa, Asia, then it's not, it's not a problem of, of, uh, of region, in particularly Europe or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or US, data is universal. Uh, then uh, when we speak uh, about uh, two regions, I think it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, for, for us, it's not uh, pertinent. Then uh, I'm uh, mm. the African uh, or Asian, uh, Asiatic uh, person. Uh, and uh, another question is possible. Then about, uh, about consentment. When, uh, when uh, I, I surf in the internet, we have uh, cookies accept, uh, please. Uh, and um, and uh, it is please if you are, uh, please accept cookies, but it's obligation to, act, to, to, to accept to, to state web, mm -hmm. to, to accept cookies. And uh, I should, I think it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not a solution about, uh, about uh, uh, it's, it's the form of obligation to to uh, to giving uh, consentment, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, thanks for uh, no problem. Any thoughts about cookies and and so well, on? I yeah. want to reflect on the first question that you had yeah. about a sort of universal uh, privacy approach. Yeah, that that um, I think in the long term is going to be there. Um, part of my job is that I'm a chair of. Um, a working group within uh, NENDED, it's the Dutch Standardization Institute, and uh, within that, within privacy, I see a lot of ISO standards regarding elements of privacy. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, 
I, I think ultimately there will be like a universal, universal level of, uh, of, of privacy um, that is, that is, uh, that is uh, incorporated by, by ISO. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think also that there are two big camps of, of privacy or data protection legislation. So many countries have adopted like an EU-like model globally. Um, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking here South Africa and Australia are quite good examples, if I remember correctly. And others have gone either a US or a Chinese. So there are some big camps. And I think eventually we'll, they'll, they'll meet somewhere in the middle. Exactly. Um, but yes, there is. That's a compromise. <coughs> yeah, as a compromise. Um, uh, Karen. Yes, about the cookies. Um, <coughs> indeed, that's uh, an interesting one because, in fact, cookies uh, should be made uh, easy to refuse. And that's a lot of companies do errors against that uh, because they, it's uh, all uh, checked in the box uh, that you uh, accept all. It's, it's made easy. It should, it should be the, the other side. Uh, so it's uh, difficult uh, to, to, um, uh, to accept. Uh, and a lot of companies also get fines for that. Uh, so Facebook got a fine for that in France, 60 million euros, because they made their cookies not easy uh, to refuse. The same with uh, Google. Uh, got a fine for that also in France. Uh, it was the same uh, Google Facebook uh, because uh, they, they made their cookies too uh, easy to accept all. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of mistakes are made against that. Yeah. There are only two regulators in the world who scare me. The first is the Monetary Authority of Singapore. <laughs> yeah, you know. If you know, you know. The other one is CNIL. Yeah. CNIL are awesome at data protection and they really do go for it. Anyway, sorry, you are going to say something? <coughs> no, uh, about the cookie, I think the things have been changed in the last two years because on many sites I see that uh, pop-up that uh, leaves you the options as it should be. Like the cookie shouldn't be set it up, accepted by default. Uh, you can choose for each cookie which cookie you accept. Uh, there are some cookies that are necessary, technical cookies, but otherwise there are advertising cookies, marketing cookies, and so on. That by default should be not accepted. Mm -hmm. And as a user, you should have see the list and uh, refuse all. But if you click OK, the site shouldn't activate all the cookies. Should go without them. So you should have the options. And yeah. also the opt-out options, which all the browsers have. have but we all know developer, uh, developers are lazy, right? It's easier to program the website with all the cookies working than it is without the cookies not working. Right, panel. Um, Time to think of your one-line summary, but we'll go and we'll have our American friend, have her question, final actually. question. I have a question. Should I do the question for it now? Okay. Go so for it. They, uh, Michael Redman again. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, Mike, we just finished taking, a number of us just finished taking the data, um, uh, the digitation transformation course here. We finished <coughs> yesterday. And part of our main course was about how can we get new and better data to use? So we do know who took that cookie at 6 a.m. in the morning. It's different <laughs> if I'm finding it or having it. So, uh, you know, and this was, and the new technology that's come up. My question is ISO 27701 yep. that ties in with ISO 2701, which deals with the security aspects and such, is dealing with the security aspects as current. And 2701 was just updated, but 27701 was not updated. It deals with mm -hmm. privacy aspects. So my question is, um, how do we, even when the ISO world, you know, dealing with that, since PCB is predominantly ISO classes, uh, how do we deal with the digitization, which we want to do? We want to get bigger and better. We want to be able to uh, eventually, you know, have Siri just call us and say, by the way, so-and-so needs cookies, just send them. They, have, they, they don't know it yet. You know, we want to get to that point where we don't, or the refrigerator calls and says, I'm almost out of milk, tell them to send it. You know, that's what we want to be if we, in the class we took, that's, that's our goal. On the other side, as a privacy, how do we deal with the ISO 2701 and implement that? And do you think, obviously, you know, 160 countries agreed on it based on the technology now. How often, and knowing how ISO often doesn't update for seven years, you know, how often do you think it's going to be updated or five? Well, there have been some that have not been done since 2000, whatever. Uh, all I know, some I of them know. are seven years old. <laughs> it's supposed to be, we know it's sooner, but it's not been happening. So my question is, how does the ISO world deal with that aspect, with all of these new changes coming up, considering the security aspects of it and the privacy aspect, and how do they tie that closer together? 
could I answer that? Yes. Uh, because I'm in a lot of working groups regarding that. Mm. Um, what they do is they, they take a specific, ver very specific element and then they try to gather experts from all around the world to just cover that specific aspect. So there were about uh, hundreds of new ISO standards coming up, all dealing with a different, very, very specific uh, element. That's the, mm -hmm. that's the way that they do it. But they don't have like a global, uh, they, they have a global overview of all the different standards, but they don't have one standard that, that covers it all. They don't, and they probably never will. Uh, I, do you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? Okay. Uh, so, obviously, from my ISO viewpoint, um, I don't think we'll ever be able to write an ISO standard that covers privacy or data protection, in inverted commas. Um, I think a lot of it will focus more on trying to solve particular problems like IoT, cybersecurity in IoT, or protection of information or protection of data in the IoT environment. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. I don't think we'll ever get in front of it. Laws, regulations and standards never ever really get in front of the technology or the pace of change just by their very nature. So I think we're going to go through cycles whereby we'll have digital transformation and it's a free for all where it's a little bit like the Wild West where some companies just, oh, whatever, if we get fined, we get fined, we'll live. And other companies will be quite sensible and event eventually we'll come to a point where those that do the right thing by the consumer and the consumer thinks they're getting value and they're not getting, sh they're not getting their data ripped off, they're the ones that will survive. But that doesn't mean that the data protection that we now recognise may be in force in 20 years' time. I think this, going back to your comment, which wasn't flippant at all, which is this is going to be a journey. There will never actually be a point where we can say we've solved this problem. Um, I think it, I think it's a job for life. <laughs> Maybe quite a few lives, but we'll <laughs> we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So, um, thank you very much for your participation. I'm going to let. I have I have five points that I've kind of got out of the, out of the conversation today. Would you like to start off your quick summary and then we'll close? Um, I, I, I think that if we can all work towards a universal uh, standard that is somewhat lowering the bar compared to what we have now, but we can all in the world make use of it, that would be a, a great benefit. Brilliant. <coughs> Karen? Yeah, I wanted to say something about uh, the privacy shields. Uh, privacy shield, not data protection shields. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, in fact, a framework between the EU and the US uh, uh, until 2020, yeah, because there was a case against it. It was Max Schrems, uh, who, who is a lawyer, an Austrian lawyer and data privacy activist. Um, uh, and, and what was the problem? Uh, so why uh, doesn't that exist now anymore? Because in America, authorities could get access to the data uh, whenever they wanted. So that was a big problem. Yeah. Um, and the second uh, thing is that in, in the US, there is no independent institute uh, when a EU citizen has a comp complaint. That was the second uh, problem. And the third problem, because you have now the standard contractual clauses uh, between uh, EU and US, so they can be used only if technical and organizational measures can be taken to yeah. protect the data. So still now we, we use this, but you have to know that in now in 2022, uh, so the leaders of the US under Biden and uh, um, uh, EU um, uh, announced that a new data transfer framework had been agreed to in principle. So we expect this, I hope, very soon. Eh? So it will be, I hope, a new uh, uh, privacy shield. But not a Shrams tree, eh, because uh, <laughs> I hope then it's, it will be, it will be uh, okay. So that is coming up uh, Excellent, very soon. thank you. Your quick summary, please. Summary, quick summary. I think that the uh, US and EU, as you probably some of you mentioned, has different legislative experience, different history, different view, point of view from, in particular for data protection in general for privacy. I think that in Europe, if we, we have this great experience, we're protecting the personal data, we should, uh, we should help our business partners from US to, to implement as effective uh, compliance programs. And uh, at the le public level, I think that the US should be supported to, <coughs> in, uh, to take a federal, to adopt a federal act that cover all the US. Uh, they have to learn, they can learn from EU, from UK and a lot of uh, states across the globe. 
and they should do something to prevent uh, the risk that can occur in fu future because they have a lot of practice available. Excellent. So I'm, I'm going to say simple. I don't think either of them is better. I don't think there's any, there's any real thing about success or not here. I just think they're different. And actually, the best thing we can do is embrace those differences, work out where the interactions and where the connections are, and work to make those as strong as possible. Because that is how actually we'll get to what we've been talking about here, which is better understanding globally, better ways forward globally, and better data protection. Um, please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>